So this week, so apologies for anybody who's expecting physics, because I hope I made it clear. No physics in here. Physics will rear its ugly head a couple of times, but basically this is a talk about non-physics. Um, uh, and well, let me just start after all those apologies. So probably the most boring talk about Vancouver you'll ever, you'll ever hear. So it uh, focuses a lot on these things, the lane waves. Vancouver is a little unusual in uh, cities in the world in having this really quite rigorous laneway system hiding behind all the streets. So there's laneways and alleyways in all cities in the world, but Vancouver is very, very laneway centric. So once you start wandering around Vancouver, uh, you discover the laneways are a lot more interesting than you thought they were. The beginning of this story is sometime around the middle of March 2020, where if you can think way back, uh, it seems like hundreds of years ago in some ways, uh, we were told that we were going to start going have online classes and be discouraged from coming to work and so on. So then uh, we're working from home. We're sitting there on Zoom calls all day. People are thinking about how to make bread and buy toilet roll and all the other things that people did during the pandemic. Adventurous people are starting to think about how they get exercise. So there's lots of different interesting ways that you can get exercise. And I thought about all of these things during the pandemic, but mostly not for very long. And then I realized that basically the only thing that I'm any good at is walking because I've like walked for more than 50 years now and I'm like, quite good at it by now. Um, and it just mostly involves putting one foot in front of the other. So I started going out in my neighborhood. So I live in this rough neighborhood and I sort of went round and round the park for a few days and that got fairly boring, fairly fast. So then I realized, well, there's a lot more to Vancouver than that. So then I just started like leaving my house and just going in a random direction until I felt like I'd had half an exercise and then coming back. Uh, and I did that a whole bunch of times in lots of different directions. And then I thought, well, you know, I could start by being a bit more systematic because after all, I'm at least part an, an astronomer and all astronomers do is like count stars and name them and stuff like that. So I should be like really systematic about this. So I should like not just go around the park, but go around all the streets and then maybe just, you know, make my way out filling in the streets. And then I'm like, oh, but there's laneways. So then I have to fill in the laneways. So, which is twice as much work. So then every day I would walk a block. Um, I don't have a telephone. So I, I, I try to get the map in my head, map out where I'm gonna go and then fill it in, try and figure out how to have the least repeats of streets. And then it turns out there's an extra laneway or something and it completely messes up the system you had in mind and you have to rewalk streets anyway. So then when I came back, I would try and fill in on the map where exactly I'd been to make sure I didn't miss anything. So I started making these maps covered in red pen. Um, and then I realized that this is a much bigger task than I sort of had in mind. And, uh, you know, maybe if the pandemic lasted like months, I might do a reasonable chunk of Vancouver. But little did I know that it was going to last longer than that. Uh, this is a map where the light green lines are the streets, so the things you normally think about mapping out Vancouver, and the darker lines here are the laneways. So there's basically a whole network of laneways that's essentially the same size as the network of streets. So I started filling in all the laneways in my neighborhood, um, and then I did it further afield, and then I did it even further afield than that. And then 20 months later, uh, I have this map that takes, you know, I have, when I have to unroll it and it takes up, I mean, I live in a small apartment, so it takes up most of the apartment probably. Um, so on, on, uh, 20, on the 15th of November, when I got to 27th in Skeena, I'd, I'd walked everywhere in Vancouver, essentially. Um, and like nothing happened when I got to 27th in Skeena. There were no, <laughs> there were no like fireworks and people didn't come out to, congratulate me or anything. Uh, so I just did a went, yay. And then somebody saw me and I went, you know, <laughs> do that. 
Uh, uh, so one of the places physics rears its ugly head is I did meet many physicists, members of this department, on my route. As I went further east in Vancouver, I met fewer and fewer, because most people live on, on the west side, but I did meet a lot of people from this department, and I did discover lots of neighborhoods in Vancouver. So there are many parts of Vancouver where, even if I'd been there before, I'd not really looked, because uh, you know you see a lot more when you're walking than when you're driving or on the bus or something. So Vancouver has a lot, a lot of neighborhoods. So what I put here was um, in sort of pink or general areas. In red are the official district names of parts of Vancouver. Sometimes they're split into two. Uh, and in purple are things that are just sort of informal neighborhoods, right? So, you know, every neighborhood has its own characteristics and you learn things about them. And every day I would, you know, come home and look things up and, uh, and learn vast amounts about Vancouver. So these are all, you know, these are the names of all the neighborhoods. But of course, you know, one of the things that we learn is that Vancouver wasn't here before 1850 or something. It was basically nothing. So everything is essentially around 100 years old, uh, except there were people here before that. So in particular, uh, uh, one of the places that I have not walked around yet is labeled as Musqueam 2 on there. So that's where the Musqueam people's sort of headquarters are. Uh, that was completely off limits with a sort of checkpoint. And I did chat to the guy at the door and he said, you know, only if it's absolutely necessary and there's a really good reason will I let you in. And I said, you know, I'm trying to walk all the laneways in Vancouver. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I don't think you understand. So I have not walked around the Musqueam. Uh, uh, who, whose land is at least point gray and a large fraction of this thing. So normally we do these land acknowledgements. So I thought instead of just doing the standard land acknowledgement, you know, what are the names for some of these places that I've just shown you? So the earliest map that has really good information was put together by Major Matthews, who I've now discovered was Vancouver's first archivist the Vancouver Archive is named after him because he basically collected stuff in his house until it turned into the city archives. Uh, city Archive building is named after him. There's a park named after him. Major Matthews, I think, was a pretty cool guy. So he was pretty interested in the First Nations history at a time when that wasn't very common. So he was friends with many of the local First Nations people and gathered lots of information, including drawing this map which I think is essentially the first map that contains First Nations names for things. So you can look up, uh, you know, you can look up this map, which of course has been adapted and improved and so on. If you want the sort of more official word, there's a nice website run sort of jointly by the Musqueam and by Canada Heritage, where uh, all the sites have little dots and you can click on the dot and it will expand it. So you can learn, for example, that uh, point gray is is oxen, I think. I think the question mark is a kind of glottal stop. So, I, I mean, I'm not very good at pronouncing uh, uh, these words. The language is called Hunkamanum. It's the local First Nations language. It sounds fantastically cool. We should all learn some of it because it's one of the greatest things that our First Nations uh, neighbors uh, have, have that's, that's totally different and uh, uh, you know, we should know much more about it. Anyway, if you're interested in actually learning about what the names of parts of the land are where you live, then I encourage you to go to that website. Okay, so let me go back to what I learned about different parts of Vancouver. So what did I learn about houses? So first of all, there's lots of colors to the houses. So where I grew up in Britain, there are very, very restrictive building codes, and you can't have houses that are any of these colors in Britain, essentially. Uh, so it's, it's always sort of spectacular to me that you can have brightly colored houses. The houses come in different shapes and sizes. There's a kind of typical West End, uh, West side of Vancouver house, which doesn't look like this because you need to put these, uh, you need to put these extra roof parts on. Then you need to have pillars that are fatter at the bottom than the top. Maybe there's a fancy word for that, but. They're all over Vancouver. Uh, you need to have a weird shaped window somewhere for no particular purpose. You need a bunch of fake 
uh, stone facing at the bottom of the building and so a staircase. Uh, and the, some of the old buildings look like this and most of the new buildings look like this because it's what they're supposed to look like apparently. You know, so here's a, you know, here's a real house <laughs> that has all those features. It's not hard to find houses with all these features. Once you start getting to the east side of Vancouver, things look a bit different. There's a thing called the Vancouver Special, which you can read about. So Vancouver Special is essentially, you start with the same house, but you cover the bottom half in fake brick, usually multicolored fake brick. Uh, you stick a big window on the left-hand side and a big door on the right-hand side. Uh, and then you put a balcony up there that has these sort of wiggly fence thing. I don't know what that's for. And I've asked people that have those balconies and they go, yeah, I never thought about that. What is that? Why don't I have a straight balcony? But they're not usually straight. Normally the front garden is a plain lawn and it's fenced, right? But that's okay because normally the back garden is like a market garden with like tons of vegetables and stuff being grown. So that's a typical uh, East End house. And here's an example. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a million houses that look exactly like this. So I learned a lot of stuff from houses. Walking around the streets, I learned a lot of stuff from streets. It turns out that there's 651 official street names in Vancouver. Plus there's private roads and laneways that are also named particularly downtown and forest trails with names and so on. So there's a lot more than 651 total named things that you can walk in Vancouver. Um, and they come often in bunches. So they're named after various things. So in the region where I live, uh, we have battles. So there are uh, at least five streets named after battles, some more famous than others. Um, and I have, you know, sometimes people say, how do you get to such and such? And I say, well, it's in the middle of the streets named after battles. And they look at me like I'm a crazy person because they didn't, they didn't know that Alma was a battle or Blenheim was a battle. Uh, there's actually lots of other streets in Vancouver also named after battles that are not in this part of Vancouver. So for example, in Jericho lands, which was the former uh, military base and in the Falaise region and the east side of Vancouver, which was built for World War II veterans, basically. They're all named after things to do with wars, essentially. And Hastings, it's a little complicated, but that was a battle. Um, and, uh, you know, Culloden has something to do with Scotland, which is why I'm wearing this face mask today. A little further east than that, there's a whole bunch of trees. Okay, so there's all trees in a row, except for Burrard Street, and Granville Street, which already have names, right? Uh, this is sometimes referred to as Hamilton's Arbor after a guy called Hamilton, obviously, who was, who was the surveyor. And the story is supposed to be that Hamilton planned all this out and then he went off surveying somewhere else and left his assistant. And Hamilton's plan to have these in alphabetical order was completely abandoned by his assistant. So the order is completely random which doesn't really make any sense because there's no, there's no reason why, you know, maple is maple and not cypress. Uh, but they are in a completely random order and it's supposed to be that Hamilton got back and he's kind of mad, but it was too late. Uh, there are also lots of other uh, streets in Vancouver named after trees and they're joined quite recently in 2010 by one of the smallest streets in Vancouver, which is called Bonsai Street because it's small. Uh, which is sort of a part of McDonald's. If you, you've ever been in that neighborhood, McDonald's in 16th. Uh, so after that, if you go even further east, you come to provinces. So the provinces were named similarly by surveyors and so on. The names are somewhat shortened. So instead of Prince Edward Island, it's Prince Edward. Instead of New Brunswick, it's Brunswick. Instead of Nova Scotia, it's Scotia. There's no Newfoundland because it didn't exist when the names were given. And then they're in order, right? And instead of British Columbia, it's just Columbia, right? So they're in order, Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Columbia, Alberta, Yukon, right? So I don't know what the hell they were thinking, but it's like, it's almost in order. And you get to Columbia and you're like, hold on a minute, is this supposed to be British Columbia? Uh, there's lots of other groupings of names. And again, because I'm Scottish, I thought I would point out the Sir Walter Scott names. So Sir Walter Scott comes from roughly the same part of Scotland that I do. He's not a direct relation as far as I'm aware. 
Uh, he wrote a lot of books. He essentially invented the historical novel. He was seriously popular for many, many decades. So, so popular, in fact, that, that no fewer than 10 of his novels have streets named after them. So if you just think how weird that is, you know, you could have a philosopher's stone street and a goblet of fire street and, so, and that would be weird. So, you know, that's how weird this is. There are literally 10 streets and maybe two other streets that are connected to Scott that were named after his novels. Uh, there are other themes for streets in Vancouver. So for example, near off Blanca, there's a little street called Simpson. In downtown, there's Homer, Seymour, and Nelson. Uh, and they were obviously all named after this TV show. Uh, as you walk around Vancouver, you realize that it's mostly on a grid system, uh, but it's more complicated than that. So it's much harder to plan out these walks than you would think it is. And the reason is because there are all these diagonal alleys, right? And they all go that direction for some reason. There are no diagonal streets really that go, that are on the other diagonal. Um, and all, most of these streets have laneways associated with them. So Puget Drive and Connell Drive have a laneway in between them and so on. Uh, Kingsway has laneways on both sides, which if you're a cyclist, you know is much, much safer to cycle along than Kingsway is. Um, so that mucks up trying to block off a grid and made it much more complicated to make sure that I didn't miss things, but also didn't do too many things too many times. Right? And as I walked around, I realized that most days I would see at least one of these. And it turns out there's 253 of these in the city of Vancouver. Um, so most days, if I was doing an urban walk, I would, I would pass one of them and maybe see another one. So, you know, some days would be a one post box day and some days would be a two post box day. And occasionally it's, it's a three post box day. <laughs> uh, one of the weird things you notice is that most streets have a sidewalk on them for random reasons that don't make sense. Some streets have no sidewalk. And then some other streets, just to totally confuse you, have a sidewalk for a while and then it just stops. <laughs> so I have no idea what's in somebody's head. When, but there's a lot of these in Vancouver. And you're literally walking along the sidewalk and then like, hold on a minute, what is going on here? Um, another thing you see as you're walking around streets is public art projects. It turns out that new construction above a certain size has to give money for public art or public art. Um, and I think there's also deals where if you do a little more on the public art side or a little park or something, you can have an extra floor in your building or something. So there are deals you can make with the city. So because of that, there are public art things all over, uh, all over Vancouver, including you know these slabs, which I particularly like, uh, the Douglas Copeland giant gold tree, the big white crystal trees that are on on Grand Hill, uh, the giant sparrows that are in Olympic Village, these uh, white and blue running shoes, um, and one that I really enjoyed was this one that's on a relatively new development on Canby Street called 900 Oranges. And again, because I'm a scientist, I see the 900 Oranges and all my way back, I'm trying to figure out whether that has 900 Oranges. <laughs> and of course, it doesn't, right? <laughs> so this is a square pyramid and the square pyramidal numbers are 1, 5, 14, etc. You can figure it out. And then if you're like me on the way back, you try and figure, it has to be a cubic. You try and figure out what cubic it is and eventually you look it up on Wikipedia and realize you got it wrong, but you were on the right track. <laughs> so it's nn plus one, two n plus one over six. Uh, this has 13 on a side. So it should be 819 oranges. So I don't know where the other 81 oranges came from. They must be really small oranges somewhere in the middle. So I just find that annoying. <laughs> I mean, it's a cool art project, but really guys, you could, right? You could, you could have got the number right. Or you, it could be called roughly 900 oranges. <laughs> okay, but it doesn't have 900 oranges. Um, as I started going further afield, I started getting into parks and forests. So I learned that there's a lot of parks around uh, Pacific, there's a lot of tracks around Pacific Spirit Park. So I did a lot of walking 
around all those trails and then Stanley Park, uh, which is actually a bit smaller. Uh, I think there's at least 80 kilometers of trails in Pacific Spirit Park and 30 kilometers in Stanley Park. Uh, I walk like all the trails, so I walked way more than this because sometimes I have to do both sides because it's divided or something. So, um, so I walked vastly more than this. It took a couple of weeks to do Stanley Park. Um, there's at least 230 parks in Vancouver. There's a nice website which you can look up where a bunch of park aficionados rate the park. Some parks are like just little triangles of grass that the city owns because nobody else does. Um, but there's lots of really cool parks all over Vancouver. I thought I would show you a few of my favorites just picked randomly. So there's a nice park in here called, a very small park called Chocolate Park, spelt weird. This is on land that used to be owned by Purdy's and they swapped it with the city somehow if it could be a park. And then the guy that made the sign thought it would be cool to make it like a kid would spell chocolate and the name stuck. So it's Chocolate Park, C-H-O-K-L-I-T. Um, uh, this is Duke Chilling Park. So part of Guelph Park is this nice statue that's called uh, Figure Reclining. And all the locals thought it looked a bit like something out of the Big Lebowski. So they started calling it Duke Chilling Park and eventually somebody put up a sign as an art project and then eventually the city agreed to keep the sign. So it's sort of at least semi-officially Duke Chilling Park. It's not a super exciting park and there aren't particularly people chilling in the park compared to any other park, but it is a fact that that's what it's called. Not far away is Tea Swamp Park, which is a fantastic name for a park. It's called because the Labrador tea, which is indigenous here, used to grow there. I mean, it was a swamp and it had Labrador tea. So it was, it was Tea Swamp Park and it's still called Tea Swamp Park. Uh, there's a nice park uh, overlooking the Burrard Inlet called Crab Park. So you might think that that's called because after crabs, but it turns out that it's create a real available beach, which is a terrible acronym. Okay, but th that's what they called themselves. So it's a group of activists in the downtown east side who were just saying, there's all this like empty government land, it should be a park. So in the 1980s, there was a huge set of protests and campaigns and stuff. And eventually, uh, basically the federal government gave it to the city to run as a park. So for a while it was called the Portside Park and they renamed it uh, Crab Park at Portside. This is a particularly interesting park for memorials. If you walk around it, there's a memorial to the missing women from the downtown east side. For example, there's a memorial to the Komagata Maru, which if you don't know about, I encourage you to read about. It's a shameful period in Vancouver history where they treated immigrants unbelievably badly. So go read about that. Um, and there's also a memorial to the Squamish people rescuing uh, Vancouverites from the Great Fire. So more than 100 years ago, there was a really big fire. This area was the most built up. It was near where Hastings Mill is and so on. And uh, uh, the First Nations people were still more or less living where they used to live before they were completely moved on. There was a whole bunch of Squamish people over in North Vancouver who saw the smoke and flames and came over in their canoes and basically rescued people from the fire. Uh, so it's a fantastic piece of, uh, um, uh, you know, back, back in the day when people actually got along before everything went horribly wrong, I would say. Um, and there's a very nice memorial to the, uh, to the actions of the Squamish people in the Great Fire. There's lots of other parks, some serious, some less serious. One of the least serious, just to lighten the tone again here, is uh, Slidey Slides Park. Um, which Riley told me about, it must be his favorite park. Uh, I know Riley grew up here, but it was only named in 2017. So I don't know why it's just his favorite park. But the local kindergarten or something were asked what they would like to name the, the slide. And maybe it's like from the Bodie McBoatface era of naming things, but the kids said slidey slides would be good. So it's officially the slidey slides park. Um, it's not really wide enough to slide down if you're most of our age, right? It's really designed for smaller kids, but you can go and at least see the name. There's a cute little island in False Creek called Habitat Island, 
where there's lots of native uh, plants growing. When I was there, I was talking to some of the neighbors about the park. And I said, you know, what, do people really call it Habitat Park? And the neighbors said, no, 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 we always call it Beer Park because it's where all the 16 year olds come to drink beer. <laughs> so apparently not really Habitat Park. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. The, the weirdest name of any place in Vancouver probably is Leg and Boot Square. So Leg and Boot Square is a very boring sort of concrete plaza on, on False Creek, on the south side of False Creek. Um, the name comes from 1887 when there was uh, a leg in a boot uh, discovered on the shoreline. Um, the police in those days were a lot less sort of softly, softly than the police are now. So the police stuck it up on a pole with a sign saying, is this your leg or something? I don't know exactly how it works. So because it hung there for a while, uh, all the all the locals started calling it Leg and Boot Square and the name stuck even when the Leg and the Boot wasn't there anymore. So it's still officially called Leg and Boot Square, uh, which is, you know, which is definitely one of the strangest names in Vancouver. I walked all over UBC. I learned a lot of stuff about UBC. So uh, one of the things I learned is that there's an awful lot of paths when you go around all the buildings. Mostly I did UBC when the campus was completely shut down. So I just walked everywhere. Uh, I mean, I just sort of ignored any signs or anything. Security guys stopped me two or three times and I had to explain that I'm a professor at UBC and it's fine. <laughs> but they were a little suspicious a couple of times because there was nobody on campus and tons of wildlife because all the, all the skunks and, and uh, uh, raccoons and stuff had all come out to play because there was nobody here. It's quite funny. There's lots of artwork at UBC, including outside our building. Um, lots of other things, including in the bottom left-hand side, that's something that's supposed to be a time machine, but it looks like an old wagon in a glass case. You've never, if you've walked past this and never read the label, I encourage you to do so, because it doesn't make any sense, really. So it's only a time machine whenever they open it, and it hasn't been opened all through the pandemic. So uh, I encourage you to go actually have a look in the next time it's actually open. And then there's this tree thing. Uh, I, you know, I took this off the internet, I have never seen a picture of that tree that looks like a tree except this one. So this must be photoshopped. Because that tree looks like nothing even when you're on top of the building next to it. But anyway, there is a tree. I learned a lot of things from laneways though, so let me get back to laneways for most of the rest of the time. Uh, it turns out there's at least uh, 680 kilometers of laneways in Vancouver. They take up three and a half percent of the area of the city. So in terms of value, it's a lot of billions of dollars worth of real estate. It's owned by the city, it's public land, except the ones that are private, obviously. Uh, it's sort of underutilized public space. It's sort of there for the garbage collectors to go down so they don't have to go down the front street. And lots of things happening in this back uh, side of all the houses. So. You know, quite often you'll see a very fancy restaurant on the street and you go around the back and it's out. You know, what are these guys? I mean, they obviously don't care what they look like from behind. And so often things look very different in the back than they do in the front, which is interesting. Um, and they just show a different side of Vancouver entirely. So I did, you know, do this whole network of things walking around Vancouver and all these laneways. The laneways look very different sometimes, you know, they're. They look like uh, very undeveloped sort of country tracks. Sometimes, uh, you know, they disappear off into the forest. Sometimes they're just little grassy paths. Sometimes it's a little footpath uh, of a laneway, right? Uh, there's, you know, there's all sorts of different laneways from, you know, very well recently tarmac laneways to ones that are completely rutted and doesn't look like you should ever drive down there. Sometimes the laneways are steps. Uh, and there's just all sorts of varieties of laneway all over Vancouver. So they all, it's very, it, you know, it's always different. Uh, during the pandemic, there was a few laneways where the neighbors were coming out to do stuff. And in particular, there was this laneway, which is off, uh, which is near Blenheim and 15th, where all the neighbors would hang flags out. And like every back of the house had flags on and they took them down and they were back up last summer again. Uh, 
There are neighbors who are very friendly. So in the back, there's like no fence or anything. And then actually across the, across the laneway from this laneway are these neighbors who have, you know, really, really don't want their neighbors to know what they're doing in their back garden. Uh, so I learned a lot about laneways and thought a lot about laneways. So, you know, if I ever have a lot more time, I'll go to the Vancouver City Archives and actually find out the history of some of these laneways that I've only speculated about. So the layout is often quite interesting. So here, for example, just to highlight it, on Waterloo Street, uh, there are laneways either side, but then on the next streets over, uh, there mostly aren't laneways. And then the laneways are very regular, except every now and again, it's not there. Or there's an extra piece of laneway. And it really makes you wonder, you know, this was mostly laid out before there were any houses. So how come it's developed into a thing which is much more complicated than a plain grid? There's a couple of weird places like this where actually the laneway splits in half around a house. Um, it's a little bit unusual, but presumably that house was there before they constructed the grid. Um, there's lots of dead end laneways like this one, and you just wonder, you know, what is it about the next piece of land that makes that not still a laneway? Uh, there's dead end laneways all over Vancouver. Um, often it says no through road. Sometimes you can go through as a person, but not as a car. So I would typically ignore the no through road signs and walk to the end of the laneway. And people would say, didn't you see the sign that says no through road? And I would say, you know, sometimes it just means a car and then we would have these long conversations. But why are you walking to the end of dead end laneways? You're strange, they would say. So sometimes you just get grids like this. So all over Vancouver, you'll see that there was a laneway and then it just isn't there. So you, you, you can't help but wonder whether some kind of bribery of the council was involved a hundred years ago. So somebody purchased the land, including the bit that was supposed to be the laneway so they could have an extra garden. So I don't think this was people recently, but, but I just wonder what happened, you know, in the 1920s or 30s or something when the grid was being laid out and, and sort of fixed. So there's definitely lots of these dead end laneways and you really wonder why. And that's probably the question that perplexed me the most when I'm walking around, because sometimes it just doesn't make sense that the laneway doesn't go through, it just stops. And then occasionally there's like extra bits of laneway. It's a little hard to see here, but there's a very narrow green strip here, which is public land that joins the two laneways. And there's no obvious reason why it should be there and not in the next block. But again, there must be some historical reason why that happened. And those properties do not own that piece of that little strip of land. And then there's laneways which are streets for a while and then turn into laneways. There are wide laneways and narrow laneways. I think this is about the narrowest laneway that I found, which is over by Prior Street in Strathcona. This is one of the few laneways I saw, which is arched. Uh, this is next to Victory Square on Canby. Um, so I have a sort of list, which I want to share with you entirely of you know, what I thought was maybe the longest laneway, the shortest laneway, the curviest laneway and so on. So if you want, if you have ideas because you think the laneway near you is, is the Guinness Book of Records Vancouver laneway for something, then let me know afterwards. Uh, I said a little bit about people in the department. Let me give a astronomy intermission at this point. So uh, there's at least four places in the city I remember where I came across astronomy. And they are these places. So UBC, obviously, the Space Center, sort of obviously, um, and then over by Nanaimo and uh, Grandview Highway, and then down in the bottom corner in the Fraser View area. So the Space Center, we all know, has this UFO outside it. It turns out, if you read about it, it's supposed to be that the top is, is in the shape of a coastal nation's hat and not a UFO. So I don't know what they were thinking, because that's a UFO, um, but apparently not. There's this... Uh, Polish care home, which is called Copernic. It has a statue of Nicholas Copernicus outside, which is which was really weird to me to discover in the middle of nowhere in, in, uh, in the southeast of Vancouver. There's a big mosaic of, of Pegasus on, uh, on, the, on this corner here. 
And then obviously over on this side of, of Vancouver, there's a whole bunch of astronomers. And this is a picture of astronomers getting together outside the Hennings building. Uh, and if you look closely, you'll notice that there's a guy who came from that UFO who's sitting in the middle of it. <laughs> um, let me just give another few examples of things I saw in laneways. So now I'm sort of imagining as I went around, there's a sort of kids game that's played in various ways called I Spy. So one of the ways you can play it is you sort of pick some objects and you get points for different objects and everybody has a different set of objects, right? So what would you get points for in a laneway? So if you were to play I Spy laneways, what would that look like? So one of them is, you know, garage doors are almost always exactly the same. So it seems like nobody has very much, uh, I mean, it just must be the cheapest, easiest garage door to get. Very occasionally people paint their garage doors and uh, down in the bottom right hand corner there's one that's completely mirrored. And I only remember one of those in the whole of Vancouver. But garage doors, you know, you get like a very small number of points for a standard garage door because they're everywhere. You get more points for finding a garage that looks older than the house that was built next to it. So that's occasionally the case and I, I always find funny. There's construction. Construction sometimes results in laneway houses. Laneway houses are often very beautiful, but I'm not 100% sure about this one. Uh, construction and laneway houses come with these things, which you see a lot in laneways. Older houses have these pulley systems for the for the laundry, which uh, depending on how affluent the neighborhood is, they've either completely disappeared or they're still there. Uh, there's also wiring, which sort of fascinated me for a while, because there's stuff where you just can't believe that it can possibly work, <laughs> because it looks like this. So the lower stuff is telephone lines, and maybe nobody cares anymore about landlines. So the stuff that has to work properly is the, the higher up stuff, which is electricity. And obviously you don't want to kill people. There's lots of these in laneways, so you get a point for a basketball hoop. You get extra points if you can find a grizzly's hoop, which still exists in a few places, but they're getting pretty rare now. That's a basketball team that Vancouver used to have for younger people. Uh, there are lots of these concrete blocks. I did a sort of photo study of concrete blocks. I discovered there's at least seven different kinds. And I got super excited occasionally when I saw a new kind that I hadn't seen before. And then people wonder why you're going woo in a laneway <laughs> at a concrete block. Gaps between garages and garden gates always have this thing. So there's always this fence which is this high and then it has a trellis work at the top. Uh, and basically the reason is this is the cheapest thing you can get at Home Depot. So everybody has these, they're unlike every house. And occasionally you see a house which doesn't have this. Somebody built their own fence, but that's pretty rare. Uh, there's lots of signs to tell you not to go in the garden because there's a dog. So there's lots and lots of different kinds of beware of the dog signs. My favorites were this one that says, doesn't just say beware of the dog, it says like serious guard dogs train here in the evening. So don't come in. It's like a serious threat. Uh, but then the best one was this one, which says that the dog can make it to the back fence in 2.8 seconds. How fast can you run? <laughs> so I, I love these signs that people had. The other end of dogs is also talked about a lot. So there's lots of signs telling people uh, to be nice with their dogs, with people's lawns and so on. And it's just interesting that there's just this spectrum from, you know, please be respectful of your neighbors with your dog to, you know, if your dog does its business here, I'll kill you. <laughs> and there's like the whole spectrum in between. And it's very amusing how some people are super polite and other people aren't. You quite often get trees in laneways. Sometimes they have battles with the wiring system and they've been cut around the trees. Uh, there's one place in Vancouver where there's a tree in the middle of the laneway. <laughs> So I have no idea what that's all about, but presumably, I mean, that car can just about get around that tree, but the garbage truck certainly can't. So it must have to go in one side and then in the other side. I'm sure they hate this laneway, right? But it is a kind of cool tree that they didn't cut down. You see a lot of garbage bins. And one of the things 
that I always found particularly amusing was uh, especially the more expensive houses, which have a little thing in the back for tucking away your garbage bins so that your neighbors didn't all see your garbage bins and it's all super twee and neat. Uh, but then Vancouver made the garbage bins bigger and none of the garbage bins fit in these special garbage bin holders. And I, I personally find that really amusing. I don't have no idea why, but it always made me laugh. I love these uh, constructed staircases that are fire escapes in the backs of larger houses. They're, they just don't look very safe. Um, so, you know, they have to be a serious fire for you to actually use this thing. But again, they're all over Vancouver. People that live on the corner are often uh, have, you know, the corner of their garage is chipped by cars and stuff. So they have these bollards. Uh, the one in the lower left I clearly didn't work very well because it's already been struck by something. Um, the tarmac in laneways is often very cracked and the city, um, the city come and do inspections of these from time to time and they put these little inspection discs in which have numbers on. I'm sort of interested to know what the numbers mean, but I couldn't figure it out. And you also get points in the laneway for piles of stuff labeled free that nobody wants. Because there's a lot of those. Um, and they're often beside signs that say no dumping. And there are, Douglas Adams has a whole thing about mattresses living on some planet and so on. So there's, there's lots of those mattress aliens that get themselves somehow into laneways. Uh, you also get points for wires with pink plastic cladding on. Uh, somebody told me the boring explanation is this is to stop people tripping over the wires. But I had all sorts of fanciful explanations, including stopping squirrels climbing up the wires and all sorts of things like that. Uh, some streets that have been, laneways that have been well paved have these speed bumps to stop people going fast. Because once you pave your laneway, then the speed demons want to take it as a shortcut. So, uh, and they have these crosses on, not because they're following St. Andrew or they're Scottish, but, but because they don't want people to trip over them, which you do in the dark, because uh, I have done. Uh, the poles also have these very bizarre markings on, which again, I'd like to know exactly what they mean. Um, and in the laneways, I also saw a lot of wildlife. So these are actual pictures that I took. I love this picture of people desperately still having their picnic in the park, even though the Canada geese are completely surrounding them. Um, and then, you, you know, you see lots of different wildlife in laneways, including this guy I saw at one point, who was, uh, who was not a welcome visitor, probably. Um, how am I doing for time? I think I still have a few minutes. So let me quickly go through the things that I wasn't sure if I would have time for. Lots of great murals all over the city. So I don't need to tell you that Vancouver has this ongoing mural festival. So murals go up fast and they're very artistic and interesting, sometimes with uh, messages that you have to read about to find out what they really mean. There's a bunch of downtown laneways that have been sort of repurposed, uh, kind of starting off with this one that's called Alley Oop. Uh, there's a laneway in uh, the eastern part of downtown Vancouver called Hogan's Alley, which uh, I read a lot about because I would always stop and read all the labels and so on. So that's Hogan's Alley in the 1930s. It was the center for the black community in Vancouver. It was essentially completely leveled when they built the Georgia Viaduct. And there are now plans to try to sort of repurpose the area to remember its cultural heritage. Uh, not very far from there, uh, there's a mural at a modular housing unit called uh, Nora Hendricks Place. Nora Hendricks was a, a very active member of the community uh, uh, many, many decades ago, and was also Jimi Hendrix's grandmother. So you can go see Nora Hendricks's house, which is on the right here. Um, I walked across a lot of bridges. So if you want to get out of Vancouver by bridge, there's several different bridges you can take. You can't walk across the Arthur Lang Bridge but you can walk across Oak Street Bridge on both sides. You can walk across the North Arm Bridge, which is the Skytrain Bridge, the Knight Street Bridge, the Lionsgate Bridge, the Second Narrows Bridge. There's the Georgia Viaduct and the Dunsmuir Viaduct, because there's actually two viaducts, etc., etc. And then if you want to get more serious, there's lots of extra little bridges. 
So there's a bunch of bridges over Boundary into Burnaby. Um, there's a bunch of little bridges across the railway line, including one which has a big sign explaining called the Militant Mothers of Graveyard Overpass, where there's a school on one side of the railway line and a big housing complex on the other side. Uh, and a few decades ago, a bunch of mothers like sat on the railway line until somebody built a bridge. And after a lot of negotiation, the bridge wasn't eventually constructed. So it is cool, you know, there's a big sign saying Militant Mothers Bridge, basically. It's a really cool story. And if you want to get more serious about bridges, of course, there's lots of other bridges, not very many on the west side of Vancouver, though, for whatever reason, they're almost all on the east side, but there are some, including the, there's this one in the Natobi Gardens, which I did walk across, but it doesn't really like go anywhere or cross anything. But when you walk across the bridges, you do see a lot of different sides of Vancouver and the neighboring communities. So these are pictures, pictures taken from some of those bridges. Next to the second narrows bridge is this cool tree house, which is sort of hidden away in the woods there. You wouldn't really see it unless you're, unless you're trying to do all the trails in the park because you wouldn't go to that corner. Uh, so I encourage you to visit it. And again, when the 16 year olds aren't on Habitat Island drinking beer, they're up this tree house, I would say, because that's, that's what was happening when I walked past it. Uh, Vancouver has these old streams that are no longer there anymore. So in particular, we have a couple near, near UBC that still exist. So that's the blue uh, coloring, but all the other ones have basically disappeared. There's various signs of them. So in Kitsilano, there's a series of bollards that tell you about the lost, uh, the lost streams of Kitsilano. Uh, and then over on the east side of Vancouver, Still Creek, which is one of the major creeks, is being sort of re, uh, uh, re brought out into the open in a, a slow series of projects. So there's actually a whole bunch of bits of Still Creek that you can see now. Uh, and again, you wouldn't see that if you drive past, you have to walk. So you can actually see where the creek is. I don't want to say much about schools, but there are at least 80 elementary schools, 16 annexes, and 18 secondary schools in the Vancouver School Board. Plus, as far as I could tell, counting at least 60 independent schools. So I walked around all of these schools and had a good look. Uh, all of the schools in VSB have this old sign saying there's a reward for damage and stuff. I really enjoyed these signs. Often the sign would say the reward was like $50 or something. Because it was, you know, 75 years ago that they put the sign up. Uh, the oldest schoolhouse was turned into a theater recently. And it's really it's a really cool looking old building. There's at least a couple of hundred a couple of hundred places of worship in Vancouver, many of which I walked around. Occasionally, I would run into the priest or the uh, uh, the minister or whatever the you know one of the people working there, and we would have a conversation about the about the history of the church and so on. So I learned a lot about the history of churches. The oldest one is is Christ Church, which is also a cathedral. It's big. Uh, there are a few older ones in that that haven't survived. The oldest Catholic one is the Holy Rosary Cathedral. And then again, because I'm Scottish, I have to say that there's also a St. Andrew's Church. Uh, I saw a lot of topiary. Uh, so people with weird hedges in their gardens or in the laneway. Lots of different public art, including sheep for some reason that I don't fully understand, uh, including a, a, you know, a COVID protected sheep. Other kinds of artwork that I just can't really describe, but some neighbors have put the thing here. It's pretty cool. There's lots of these little libraries. Uh, there's a lady who has teapots all over her garden, which is pretty cool. Uh, and there's a million other examples of these just little arty things that people have put up just to sort of make the neighbors, uh, you know, uh, feel happier, particularly during this pandemic. So some people have said, you know, what was your favorite thing? that you discovered in your whole walks around Vancouver in laneways and so on. So if SkyTrain tunnels count as laneways, then this was definitely my favorite thing <laughs> because there's like my name in 10 foot high letters that's 50 foot long. So it doesn't get much better than that. So with that, let me stop uh, and thanks for listening.